Good morning. This show is sponsored and brought to you by the Southern Nevada Health District. I am your host, Alisa Howard. I am a public health educator and consultant and owner of Minority Health Consultants. You are listening to Public Health, Just the Facts. With this show, we want to set the record straight for Southern Nevadans as it relates to all things public health. For more information, visit snhd.org. We have a fantastic show lined up for you today. On today's show, we're going to discuss COVID-19 in the African-American community. We have some special guests who will join us to discuss Black HIV awareness, being that today is National Black HIV AIDS Awareness Day. And finally, we will provide you with some current local updates to protect your family through our arm in arm against COVID-19 updates. First up, we have Shondell Newsom, who's here to talk about COVID-19 in the African-American community. Shondell, please give us a brief introduction about who you are and the work you do within the community. Good morning. Thank you again for the opportunity to join you for this uh, public health just the facts. Uh, you know, my name is Shondell Newsom, as you said, and I'm uh, the chair of the uh, board of directors for the Urban Chamber of Commerce. Also, I own some new marketing. Thank you. Shondell, you wear a lot of hats. You're a husband, a father, a business owner, and small business advocate. We hear so much how COVID-19 has affected the African-American community greatly in more ways than one. First, I wanted to ask, have you seen COVID-19 impact the small business community, specific to the African-American business community? Well, you know, yes, because African-American-owned businesses have um, been greatly impacted by COVID-19. Most of them had to close during the pandemic because of, um, you know, shutdown orders and things like that. But also we struggle with, um, you know, employee retention, employee growth, even having um, people come to work because, you know, with the impending um, um, pandemic right now. You know, you have children who get COVID, you have uh, family members and seniors, um, and everybody has a family that they have to take care of. So, you know, it, it impacts not only all businesses, but it really, really is a, a strong impact on black owned businesses. I definitely understand that as a black owned business myself, you're right, we do have people that we have to take care of. If not, you have yourself you have to take care of. So I have seen how it has impacted uh, the black business community, especially. What connection, if any, do you see between how the business community has been negatively impacted and the current state of the African-American community overall as a result of the pandemic fallout? Well, you know, culturally, things have changed, right? Many people are, are thinking about their choices, thinking about their job choices, thinking about um, health from a different perspective. Um, unfortunately, um, we should be talking about health all the time, but uh, because of COVID, we've been talking more about washing your hands and doing the things that we were always taught as kids. Um, I think, though, the, the biggest thing for the um, African-American community is that we, we suffer from so many other things that it, it, it's taken us away from focusing on our heart disease, our diabetes, our uh, traditional AIDS awareness and things that um, were on the forefront. So it, it, it pushes everything back, which is really, really bad for the black community. You're absolutely right. I think you and I had this conversation a few months ago, probably about six months ago, um, when I was in here talking to you and we were saying, where is everything else? Nothing else has stopped. High blood pressure is still out there. Diabetes is still out there. Why are we not talking about those things? So I'm appreciative of this platform to be able to, to bring up everything else in public health, not just COVID, but including COVID. Yes, because, you know, as you know, and, and you probably have the stats and everything to back it up. But, you know, um, unfortunately, black people have a lot of health issues and they're systemic. Um, some people argue whether it's racism or not, but they're systemic and, and they are what they are. The, the numbers don't lie. So I think one of the most important things is that we have to remain aware of public health. Because, at, you know, at the end of the day, I had my, my auntie who passed away from a heart attack uh, a couple of years ago. I recently just had my grandmother who passed away, had a brother-in-law who passed away from kidney failure. So th there's there's a lot of other things that are, are out there. But I think if we all run to one part of it, um, we forget about the others. Absolutely. And just from hearing all of the people that have passed around you, my condolences first and foremost, um, but even the trauma behind that, right? We yes. haven't been able to heal. We haven't been able to actually sit and breathe and take in and, and be able to grieve. So I appreciate you even bringing that up because a lot of people can probably relate to that. So thank you, Shondell. Absolutely. 
Next up, we have Andre Wade. He is going to lead our discussion about Black HIV awareness. Black HIV Awareness Day is February 7th today. And there will be events locally and nationally that we will take place um, that will take place locally here in Las Vegas and online. Andre, if you can please give us a brief descri description of who you are and what you do for the community. Well, besides Elisa being one of your good friends, right? No. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I am the state director for Silver State Equality. We're a statewide LGBTQ plus civil rights organization here in Nevada. And I also uh, teach gender studies at UNLV. And uh, some of the volunteer activities that I'm a part of, I am a member of the Nevada Office of Minority Health and Equities Advisory Council and was appointed to the Governor's Task Force on HIV Modernization. Um, I'm born and raised here in Las Vegas, so more than happy to be here talking to folks about what's going on with uh, the Black community and HIV, specifically in Clark County. Well, thank you, Andre. It sounds like you're a superstar. <laughs> or I, I tell you myself are. that, yes. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Uh, so, according to a fact sheet generated by the CDC, African Americans continue to face the most severe burdens of HIV compared to other racial ethnic groups in this nation. One of my first questions is, what can we do as a community or what can individuals do to help spread awareness and continue to combat this crisis? You know, that's a very good question. You know, there are several things that we can do, should do and need to do. Uh, first of all, we need to talk more about HIV. We need to destigmatize the conversations. We um, need to take it upon ourselves to learn more about what HIV is and isn't, including AIDS. Uh, we still have this mentality around HIV as if we're still in the 80s and 90s. And so a lot has happened with modern medicine, uh, what we've learned about how HIV is actually transmitted. And ultimately, when we start to stigmatize a uh, swath of people like gay, black, bisexual men um, who have sex with men, it allows them to then not have the conversations with others about who they are. And so people are engaging in risky behaviors and then therefore contracting uh, HIV and then also being afraid to get tested because there's so much stigma around even getting tested. So there's a low testing rate. So if you don't know your status, then you are more likely to transmit it to others. And if you do know your status, then you're more likely to get into treatment. And so it is my charge to do as much as I can to have conversations around HIV in the black community so people can know where to get tested, what the process looks like, uh, re what resources are available if one uh, learns that they're living with HIV so we can destigmatize it. Because lastly, I'll say HIV and, um, is not what it was uh, in the 80s and 90s, or not what we think it is. And so people live with HIV, um, they have healthy lives, it can be manageable with medication. Um, and so people just need to know that again, so people will be more likely to get tested so they can know their status. Absolutely. I agree with all of that. And, you know, Andre, uh, we met seven years ago now when I entered your life. I remember. I blessed your life. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and we were working in HIV. You were working at the center and I was working at the Las Vegas Urban League and I was running an HIV program. And that's how we met. So we've been battling this, you know, in Las Vegas, trying to bring awareness through community events. Can you tell us some of the local community events that are coming up? Yeah, uh, actually, in collaboration with Silver State Equality, uh, Minority Health Consultants, uh, which is led by yourself, and Black Queer Men of Las Vegas, we are producing a uh, National Black HIV AIDS Awareness Day dinner. Our, our corporate sponsor is Aetna. So we have about 60 people who have registered to come out for a free dinner to have informal, casual conversations about HIV, to have some resources uh, given to them. We are giving folks um, free HIV home testing kits and free uh, COVID home testing kits. And the idea is just to recognize this national day um, of awareness, again, to have these conversations, destigmatize de um, having the conversations in the first place, but then also providing people with uh, a lot of information and resources. And again, we're also going to try to weave in some conversations about COVID because that's very important. Um, we have a new um, Silver State Equality has a new uh, community health worker program associate named Mario Wolfolk, who's going to be doing a lot of the work um, around HIV prevention and um, our COVID-19 education project called Proud and Vaccinated and Proud. And so, again, this just gives us an opportunity to talk about a lot of public health issues um, with 60 people having dinner at Lolo's Chicken and Waffles. Well, one thing I wanted to add to that, um, um, Alisa, and, and thank you, Andre, for that, because, you know, one of the things people don't realize that people 
folks like us have family members who have AIDS, right? So when, when you have people who have um, um, AIDS, it's also good for you to be aware exactly. of all those different things. So it's not just the people who need to attend who are folks who are um, uh, contracted or, or infected, but it's also the family members around it because it goes back to that trauma piece, right? Absolutely. I always say, Shondell, that it's not just the affected, but it's the affected as well, right? So your families are affected by what you go through. If they have to take you to your doctor's appointments, if they're watching you suffer, if they you know, have to help you get your medication, because that's one thing that we don't talk about. Medication is $3,500 a month, and a lot of people don't have insurance. So that's where this health equity piece comes in, is that we're always trying to fight for people who don't have um, the same rights as everyone else. And the destigmatization. Yes. I love what he said about destigmatization, because not only as black men do we not want to talk about anything um, that is affecting us, but we have to talk about these things which are affecting us on a whole different level. Absolutely. And Andre, there is a community event as well, right? Or community resource event. Can you tell us about that? You're absolutely right. So at the center on Saturday, February 5th, uh, Black Queer Men of Las Vegas are hosting a uh, resource fair um, from, I think, 10 to 2. And then they're doing a, a talent show uh, showcase from two to four. Uh, again, that's at the center, which is uh, downtown on 401 South Maryland Parkway. And so we're really glad that these men are putting on this event, another way to get out information around HIV, COVID, and also have an entertaining showcase around it as well. Absolutely. And it's so important for our community to come out to these resource events because you're there with everybody. So you're not just there by yourself feeling like everybody's staring at me. It's a, a community event. It's about resources, about getting the education, taking the education home with you, sitting with it, reading the materials, things of that nature. So you're not just there by yourself and you can get tested. Testing is free. That's a huge thing in our community that we don't realize is that we can go get tested every month, every six months, every year, however many times we would like just to know our status. It's all about knowing your status, because when you know you can you can live. If you know that you are infected, you can live with HIV. There are people living into their 80s now because of the medicine. So please don't let HIV scare you. We have to start destigmatizing de HIV in our community and talking about it. So thank you so much, Andre, for being on the show today and talking about HIV, destigmatizing it as you are, um, and Shondell adding to the conversation as well. I would like to trans uh, transition over to COVID-19, um, but also COVID-19 and HIV do go hand in hand because we have seen a huge surplus of people having COVID-19 that are HIV positive. So it kind of goes hand in hand. Um, arm in Arm is a collaborative formed by this initiative and our community's chance to come together to share information, community resources, and have enlightened discussions Arm in Arm to protect ourselves against COVID-19. So Arm in Arm is, is a campaign per se that we're putting out because we want everyone to walk arm in arm with one another. We need the community to come together and that's what we need to do is walk arm in arm, just like Martin Luther King used to do. This is Black History Month, just like Martin Luther King used to do, walk in those um, and, and, and protest um, arm in arm. And so that's what arm in arm is about. It's working together as a community. So I wanted to provide some resource um, updates about COVID-19. As we know, we're on our third, <laughs> our third variant now. Um, and so Omicron is um, unfortunately just th going throughout the whole community and th throughout the nation and the world, honestly. Uh, Omicron is super um, contagious. And so that's why we're seeing more of it. Um, we are hearing in the public health community that um, in the public health world, I should say, I sit on CDC calls every week um, with the Southern Nevada Health District and we hear that Omicron is more contagious than any other variant that we've seen because it is winding down. And that's what we need to realize. This is starting to become more contagious and it's starting to be less uh, deadly because it is starting to wind down. What we mean by that in the infectious disease world is that when a variant has been uh, basically <laughs> going throughout the world for so long, um, it starts to wean down a little bit. Um, and so it's not at, as, it's more contagious, but it's not as deadly as we saw with the first variant. So we are seeing less cases these days um, of uh, actual hospitalizations, but we are seeing more people with Omicron. Now you're hearing the things where people are saying, oh, I have COVID, but they're at home and they're still working. We didn't hear that in 2020, right? So we want to be able to highlight that 
we want to bring some kind of hope and purpose <laughs> to the world that we are still here. We are fighting this thing and that there's still hope there. Um, a lot of people are getting down and out saying, when is this pandemic over? And I just want to bring some hope to you um, that this is um, winding down some. Shondell, you have you work a lot with uh, with COVID-19 and, and SNHD. You did a project, TOTS, at the shop. Shots for Tots. Shots for Tots. That's right. <laughs> so, you know, what it was, was Shots for Tots was uh, immunization for um, children zero to four, um, getting some of their crucial immunizations at an early age. And I think that's one thing that people have to understand, just like Andre alluded to. Um, I remember in 1980s, in 1990s when AIDS, you know, hit the streets and everybody was panicked and you can't do this and don't touch this person, don't touch that. And we learned more about it, right? It was the same thing with these immunizations. And I think it's the same thing with COVID-19. It's an education and and people have to understand that this happens um, ever, ever so often with health, right? With public health. I think the crime to it is that we don't prepare people for this before it happens. We We seem to keep it as a secret. So I think it's just real important that we have shows like this. We have people like Andre who can um, inform and educate people in the right fashion. Absolutely. And so that was part of our conversation and why the show was so important is because people were not talking about just the facts. Right. They were it was politics being brought in. All of these things that we see, we still are seeing all of that on the news media, um, not being public health <laughs> specialists, but giving their personal opinions on things. And so that's where we kind of want to just just talk about the facts. And that's why the show is called Just the Facts. We want to bring hope to the community that um, in education and information, um, a lot of people don't understand the importance of wearing a mask. A lot of people are still asking in year two, why do I have to wear this mask? I, I was in a, a store the other day and someone was, you know, they had to get, you know, told they had to go out and get a mask. And the person was like, ah, right. <laughs> you know, like, I'm tired of this. We're all tired. That's one thing that we have to realize, even as public health professionals, we're tired. You know, what's funny <laughs> is years ago we were told to wear seatbelts. People did the same thing. Why am I wearing a seatbelt? They're going to tell me what to do in my car. So it's the same thing. It's, it's a public health um, crisis, yes. right? So we're addressing it in the right fashion. Yes. Andre, how are you seeing COVID-19 um, in your, uh, you do health equity work, but you also do public policy work. How are you seeing COVID-19 come up? You know, it comes up in many different ways. Either it's affecting processes as far as in the legislature, the, the way uh, meetings are held, um, but it's also how events are not held in the community. So we don't have as many community events as we used to. People are tired of the virtual format. So even though it's this indirect way that it's affecting people, it still makes it hard to uh, get information out there. Uh, but for our uh, LGBTQ plus community, uh, specifically uh, gay men, bisexual men, we are used to things like contact tracing. Uh, when we uh, go get tested for HIV and, and STI, STD tests, uh, we've been used to contact tracing. So that wasn't necessarily an issue. But when you talked about HIV and uh, COVID, those are these considerations for people who are living with uh, several different comorbidities. And so if you are uh, living with HIV, you have hypertension. And then what is the impact of COVID going to have on you? And so we have to constantly get information out to not only the masses, but uh, specific communities who are going to be affected. And we're still tackling a lot of misinformation. And so on the advocacy and political side, as we gear up for the elections, we are having to combat misinforma misinformation and disinformation campaigns. Um, people are getting the wrong information about COVID and people are dying simply because they think that there's a chip that's affecting their DNA or that they don't trust Big Pharma, but they are taking vitamins and drinking soda that can be as more harmful than this vaccine that's actually 90% uh, effective. And so we don't understand that the way that the vaccines have come about has been groundbreaking. They've been wildly successful, but we don't hear about that. Right. And so... Uh, we have to constantly combat that because at the end of the day, people are making political choices to either vote for a particular candidate or not vote at all um, in this COVID environment. And so it becomes really challenging. So it's affecting our work in so many different ways that um, it's dizzying. And so, yeah, we're very much tired of it. We're um, exhausted by it. But we also know that this is one of the main issues that's impacting people's uh, daily lives. So no matter what, we still got to fight against it. Absolutely. You brought up some really great points, Andre. Um, 
uh, Governor Sisolak in June of 2020 declared racism as a public health crisis, right? And so as we as we embark on 2022, and we're still seeing these type of things, we're still seeing discrimination um, in the LGBTQ community, in the African American community. There's still people who don't have access to the vaccine as people are fighting in this political war um, that they've, they've created <laughs> against this vaccine, they don't realize that they're also stopping other people from even having access to this vaccine, people that want to get the vaccine. And I'm not here to advocate for the vaccine or not the vaccine. I'm advocating for lives. And if that means that you have to get a vaccine to save your life, then that's what you should do. And so I really appreciate you bringing up and your advocacy and all that you do in Silver State Equality, um, because this is a really big issue. And like you said, people are dying. And that's really why I you know, decided to say, yes, I want to do this show because people are dying. And that's my main concern is that we have to save lives. If we're in public health, we're here to give information. We have to take our personal stance out of things. We have to take our personal biases and discrimination and things that we deal with as human beings out of it to save someone's life. And that's our whole point of being here. So, Shondell, if you want to say wrap it up with some COVID-19 information. Oh, I, I think you nailed it. I think, like you said, it's about saving lives. And somebody said, well, it's not that many people dying. So how about one or two people dying? You mean not that many? Like, it's like <laughs> I mean, if one person dies, right. why are we not concerned? So I, I just think it's just, um, you know, it's ridiculous when people throw out stats and numbers. It's not as many or not. A, but that's when you sit around and you see people dying around you. It has an effect on your family. It has effect on your life. It has effect on your your mental. So I think what's important for people to understand that they're not just doing these things for themselves. So the person that walked in the store was thinking about themselves. So let's not be selfish. Let's be selfless. It's just like HIV. Maybe I don't have it, but maybe my, one of my siblings or one of my kids or somebody else has it in the community that I'm serving. So I got to always be looking out for the other person, not necessarily always looking out for myself. Absolutely. Community is all that we have. And that's what this is all about, is that we have to get back to the point of community. If we're all here for each other, then we have to be here and care about each other's uh, health and finances and everything else that's going on with the person. And once we get back to that, I really think that we can end this um, this uh, pan pandemic, honestly. Uh, there's so many different pandemics that are happening right now, but we can end this COVID-19 pandemic once we realize, oh, I can help someone else. Let me do that. Let me put my mask on. Let me social distance. Let me possibly get a vaccine if you're eligible, um, things of that nature. So I just want to thank my guests today for being here um, and talking about this this tough topic and talking about HIV. We know that it's it's stigmatized, but we are trying to destigmatize it by talking about it. So we really appreciate you being here and giving your opinions and your advice on things. One thing I would like to say and just kind of end it with some some factual information, because this is just the facts, um, is that this is flu season as well. And we need to get our flu vaccination. So that's the funny thing about this. The flu vaccine um, was developed because of the 1918 flu pandemic. So this is not the first time that we're hearing about a pandemic. We had a pandemic in 1918, um, exactly 100 years ago. So as Shondell stated earlier, this thing happens every now and then. <laughs> so, uh, nature just, you know, erupts every now and then. And so that's where the flu vac vaccine came from. So we are seeing that the COVID-19 vaccine is coming out of this um, pandemic that we're coming out of. And then Andre and I just read this morning that the mRNA vaccine is actually going to help people with HIV. So... This is really big groundbreaking news because what we see is that when one thing happens, something good can come out of it as well for a, a lot of other people. There's more than, I believe, I don't want to give the wrong stats, but there's billions and millions of people living with HIV around the world. So the fact that this pandemic happened is horrible. We hate it. <laughs> we want it to end. It actually is bringing something really great out of it. And so out of uh, pressure uh, sometimes comes beauty. So I would like to end this show by thanking everyone for being here. Thanking my guests, Andre Wade and Shondell Newsom. This broadcast has been underwritten by the Southern Nevada Health District in partnership with KCEP 88.1. And I'm your host, Alisa Howard of Minority Health Consultants. Thank you for listening.